Thank you, Leander. Good morning, everyone. There was a time when business was easy, making a buck or two was easy, and the reality, as you've seen from that previous little snip there, in fact, life was easy. And isn't it surprising how in recent years, all of a sudden, it wasn't Hasbro, the big board game players of Monopoly and Cluedo and Risk, who were the ones who invented Sony PlayStation or Xbox. Isn't it amazing how it wasn't the big music industry who were the ones who came up and invented iTunes, but rather a computer company. And I can go on and on and on giving you examples about what appears to be is not actually the case, or how people don't evolve. And when they don't evolve and stay relevant, and they don't keep up with what the customer wants, as Wilfred has just so keenly shared with us over there, that's when businesses run into trouble. Or alternatively, they become irrelevant. So the truth of the situation is, in our industry, and we are a young company, we're only a couple of years old, so or son, but the reality is when they deregulated or legalized gaming as such, there was a mad flurry in this country, and in fact, banks didn't want to lend anyone money, they didn't know what the industry was going to be like, and anyhow, it was such a commoditized industry, if anyone asked me and challenged me and said, what's the one product which has never ever changed, I'd probably have to go to something like blackjack or roulette. From the 1940s when Bugsy Malone was uh, playing in uh, Las Vegas as far as the, ma the mafia, the reality is 21 was 21. You couldn't make it 22. And the cards are the same, the deck's the same, the rules the same. Nothing has changed for over 70 years in that game. It's a commodity. So it was then a case of, well, are we going to do same old, same old? Is this going to be a situation where we're just going to roll out and carry on doing what Sun International had so successfully done in those wonderful days when they used to have the paparazzi and all the glitz and glamour and the international stars off the back of the TBVC countries? And if you'll remember, Frank Sinatra and Old Blue Eyes and, and Queen and all of the guys used to frequent Sun City. Well, it was a different environment. It was a different time to go out there and do business. With the product not evolving, it wasn't for us to start changing and introducing new games. We weren't quite a design company or an Apple. We weren't there for trying to make inroads into changing the lie of the land as such. And all those trappings and the similar offerings, staleness had probably crept in. It was a 20, 30-year-old industry. Irrelevance was probably the order of the day. And ultimately, the industry image was quite tarnished and hard done by. I'm not here to talk to you today about brand. I'm not here to talk to you about brand promises. I'm not here to talk to you about above-the-line or below-the-line marketing. In fact, I'm not even here to talk to you today about Soho Sun. Soho Sun has got many facets to it. A lot of people don't realize it. We've got 96 hotels, 14 casinos. 
We've got 1,200 brands. And those brands that we pull together under the Soho Sun label range from everything from Nelson Mandela's house in Vilakazi, where we're the curators for that museum, right the way through to the Apartheid Museum in South Africa, to theme parks, to butterfly parks, to bird gardens, to the arts and culture of this country, to obviously hospitality. Yes, we've got <coughs> 248 venues for conferencing and banqueting in the mice market, which range from boutique little beautiful wood-paneled boardrooms at uh, um, Palazzo Hotel all the way to the Santon Convention Center, which we look after. We've also got 244 restaurants. We will shortly serve the black farmer sausages. <laughs> but the truth is, I'm here today to talk to you not about any of that, but rather to try and put you in a position that we faced, which I hope, and I'll share my perspective, Soho's perspective, and if you guys can pull it down and relate it back to the very industry or life, stage of life that you are in, then I believe that I would have achieved my objectives. So, yeah, guys. <clears throat> what I want to talk to you today about is that secret weapon that you're going to have to identify and find within your arsenal. It's the structure of your business. It's subtleties. Understanding what type of business you're in. You see, retailers think they're in retail and they're not, they're in banking. They buy long, sell short, they work with the time value of money. And anyone who says they're from retailing doesn't understand the business that they're truthfully in. By the same token, when you thought that you were doing quite well with uh, the computer industry, suddenly a bank, F&B, become the biggest suppliers and distributors of iPads. And once you start understanding the structure, the nuances of your business, and appreciating what business you're in, how you're going to attract customers, what is the true nature, and not only legal, but what is the, within the spirit of what is the nature of the business that you are in. We have 45 million people who frequent our businesses per annum, counted. <clears throat> I don't know if there's any other business in South Africa that does 45 million people, but every single one of those customer interactions has to take place on our property. You don't buy it and consume it at home. You don't take it and consume it elsewhere. You have to experience it on our property. Whether you come in for a th thrill white-knuckle ride at the theme park, whether you're coming to look into history at the apartheid museum, whether you're coming to sleep a night in one of the hotels, whether you are having a meal, experiencing a show, coming out for chill time, going to a movie, whatever it is, the bird gardens, if there's a party in the 10-pin bowling at Magic Camp, I don't mind what it is, but you've got to consume whatever it is away from home. Therefore, it is our simple task and challenge to be able to make sure that when you get your customer to make the decision to get up off the couch at home, and they're going to go out, best you remain relevant, you remain real, and you remain enticing to make sure that that customer comes to your destination. Now, a lot of people also erroneously always think, oh, we're in hotels and gaming. <laughs> Therefore, our opposition and competition will be Empress Palace, Carnival, Sun International. They're not. They're in the same business. They are not our competition. Our competition is when the Olympics is on television and people choose to stay at home. When there's a big rugby game and they choose to have a bry and ask people over. Our competition is video conferencing where people now don't have to travel. Our competition is low-budget airlines who will get you in on the red-eye flight at 6 o'clock and you can come out again at 6 o'clock and you don't have to overnight when you go down for a trip to Cape Town. Our competition is Santon City who've got a wonderful retail experience and our competition is Melrose Arch, if you're keeping it local and I'll make reference to Monte Cassino here. 
Who hasn't been to Monte Cassino in the room just by way of show of hands? Good. Oh, bad. Okay. What I'm going to do today, because I'm limited for time, I'm going to just share with you some of how we've structured and how we made, I believe, ourselves relevant, decommoditized, and we'll show you little subtleties which will change your, hopefully, understanding of what we've done when you understand who our true competition is and what we're trying to do. So in fairness, I wanted to create a world where magic lives in every person. We wanted to create a world where passion, Wilfred's just spoken to you about passion, it's one of his big key focus points, where that whole center stage, where imagination becomes reality, when time stands still, where you can dream, dare, and be bold. Now that's an environment that we had to create. That's an environment that you've got to instill through culture systems within your staff. We have 18,000 staff, and it's quite a difficult challenge to infiltrate this through the staff. This is a culture that we've got to live. When we wake up in the morning, not that we expect guys to stand up and do the Soho Sun war cry and pull on their Soho Sun underpants or anything, but the reality is, if you're going to be in the service and hospitality in industry, and if you're going to be entertaining up to, on a busy day at Monty, 55,000 people per day, the reality is you better be, knowing that you've got all these touch points, you better be on top of your game, and your game better be better than anyone else in town. I want you to remember this, because the, this will be the start, as I will finish, when I show you, hopefully, the finished product. The first thing we had to engage on was the senses. Ah, everyone does that. That's time honored. That's fine. But we had to really get into it in a big way. We had to structure and build Monte Cassino. For those, for the one gentleman who hasn't been there, it's a 15th century Tuscan village. When it was being built, people used to ask, why are they building such an old building? We said, well, it's Tuscanese from Italy. They said, where's Italy? <laughs> it was a themed environment. We purposely built it as in a themed way. One, because of its Tuscan nature, but two, because it cost five billion rand to replace today that brick and mortar. And when you sink five billion rand into the brick and mortar, well, the truth is you don't have much opportunity to change it there and after. So if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. The beauty of it is when it's a 15th century theme building is that when you get it wrong, as it ages, you have less maintenance capex. Maintenance capex can sink you. To try and maintain a building with, with 5 billion rand can seriously be a big dent on the income statement and balance sheet. So the reality is we had to go around and say, right, we've built what we've built. It is what it is. We're benefiting from the fact that we don't have to have repair maintenance. But in truth, we've got to therefore activate. And the thing that we infiltrated right from the beginning in the organization was mind and mood. In fact, so serious did we take mind and mood that the second most senior person who runs Monte Cassino, a lady by the name of Helen Stewart, She's, no long, she's with us in head office now, but at the time, I appointed her, and she was a senior marketing lady, and I told her her title has changed. She's now the mind and mood manager. She was a bit taken aback, but I think once she realized that we meant business and we were serious about it, she reveled in it, and to the best of my knowledge, she was the only mind and mood manager that I knew of, at least in South Africa. So we touched every one of those senses. We built the business. We structured it. We infuse 5 million rands worth of smells through the air conditioning at Monte Cassino. Not to make it smell nice, but to pick up the seasons. So at Christmas time, we'll have Christmas smells. At Easter time, we'll have chocolate smells, because it usually coincides around Valentine. We are managing the place like a set. It's like a production. So we're infusing smells. You'll always pick up different smells. 
We can't change the brick and mortar. We'll change the lighting. So on St. Patrick's Day, you'll have green lighting. We'll celebrate St. Patrick's Day, not because we big into the Irish St. Patrick's Day, but because it gives us an opportunity to bring out the green. And then we'll theme everything from whiskey festivals and tasting and everything around that. Over Christmas, obviously and logically, you're going to be with your music, the tonality, the volume. We spend hundreds of hours working on that. We wanted unique sounds. So if you go out into that piazza, you will find and hear distinctly 15th century authentic Italian Tuscan village sounds when the bell chimes. Now it doesn't sound like Big Ben, but it also doesn't sound like a gewone normal clock that you get somewhere else. But we regale and celebrate in the sounds. I challenge any one of you to find a piece of paper at Monte Cassino on the floor litter. And I challenge any one of you to find a cleaner. We have got a military precision of when and how and where we clean and how we pack and what we do because we had to be better than all the other guys. There's lots of touchy-feely. There's lots of uh, um, buskers that we have through the, coming through the streets. We had to raise our game to take on big beasts like Santon City and Melrose Arch. And even, it's not just the big ones, it's the local guys down the road. Be it Design Quarters or now Nickel Way, etc. They all are competition to us. And we are in the hospitality, service and footfall industry. When we built Monte Cassino or started Soho Sun, my mission and vision was to do it around content. Because content changes every week. I can't change, remember, the brick and mortar. So what we did is we specially built it in such a way that we would get content. So we built cinemas. Because if you have cinemas and you're going to exploit cinema content, you automatically by default pick up everything that comes from Fox, Columbia, Disney, Paramount, Universal, DreamWorks, you name it, every one of those individual, Miramax, Polygram, and you can go on and on, because I get all that content for free, and I can exploit it. We also built a theater, not because we're into theater, we are now. But because the theater model in South Africa had broken. But what it did do is once we built the theater, we had content. Every one of the best performances and stage productions that come out of Broadway or from West End, we've got and bring to the people of South Africa at Monte Cassino. People think we're doing it to make money out of the box office. The truth is we're doing it for content, to change. We've also got, and I'll show you some of these things just now, we've got all the latest games, this new age, the millennials, who are into, be it Xbox, Nintendo, uh, PlayStation, you name it, we've got all of that. Now, we get all of that for free. What, what do I mean by we get it for free? Well, we've recently done a Soho ad just showing the passion and the variety and the seductiveness of the Soho Sun brand. And we had an ACDC Thunder music track attached to it. It cost us 1.7 million rand just for the rights to pay ACDC to use their song for a six-month period overlaying our advertisement. We had to pay for that. Everything else at Monte Cassino we get for free. So, whether it's flightings on top billing, whether it's on carte blanche with the New Jersey Boys or the Phantom of the Opera or the Lion King. We're in every magazine. We are advertising. We're not advertising. We are being advertised. And with all of that, it just happens and it flows and it goes and there's always something new. And every week, surprise, surprise, three movies change at the cinemas. So you've always got the new Bond movie or the Schuster movie, but you've got new movies, you've got new games coming out, you've got new books coming through, you've got new shows coming to Monte Cassino, and all it does is it brings people back time and time again because you've got something new. If it wasn't, and the easiest way I can illustrate this to you, 
If it is a static attraction, then it would be tantamount to me saying to you, go to have a look at, for example, Titanic. Would you still be watching Titanic as a great movie as it was in 97? Would you still be watching it now? You've seen it. You've been there. You've got the t-shirt. You've done and dusted. So all of this content is what we've built Monte Cassino around. The Teatro. It's the fifth largest theater in the world. It's also one which allows us to bring this new content through. It's also the very model and because I'm pressed for time, I can't, uh, and I would have gone into a whole lot of explanations on many of these different facets within the organization, but the reality is this revived theater in this country because the model had broken. You see, theater hadn't broken, but I challenge you to go and find it, all these little wonderful Alhambra theaters and the Linden and the His Majesties and all of those wonderful places we used to go and watch shows. Well, these days... If it costs 500,000 rand per performance to put on a Lion King and you've only got a 400 seats at the Alhambra and you've now got to serve drinks and you've got to employ staff who are only going to work for 15 minutes in the interval and they've got to catch three taxis to work and three taxis home and you've got to pay them a, a living wage and they're only working for 15 minutes a day, the model, she's broke. Doesn't work. So we've single-handedly resurrected the arts and culture of this country by bringing in, and we've got 20 stages around the country that we do bring ballet and culture and tap dogs and all these big shows. But we do it because it's within the spirit of what we're trying to do in terms of driving content, keeping fresh, and bringing people back time and time again. Everything from all these different shows right the way even to events. It's not just about shows. You can host as we've done. Dream it. Be bold. Go out. Celine Dion. We'll do a Celine Dion concert. If you want to watch uh, tennis, we'll do the SA Open Tennis there. Because we know that we've got all the infrastructure, the parking, the infrastructure, the restaurants, the loose, the security. We've got everything else there. So anything we want to do, we can do it and we'll go out and do it. The tattoo. I played golf in, uh, at, uh, in Scotland. I went over with a couple of mates to tick one of those bucket list things, played at St. Andrews, came back fortuitously. I didn't know there was the Edinburgh tattoo on in Edinburgh. I thought, we can do this. It's perfect. So we brought in, there were 800 performers in South Africa, and we started our own SA tattoo. Because... Over those four days, it brings in again a variety, lots of television coverage, lots of marketing, and it brings in 40-odd thousand people. So we have a hell of a lot of fun. Whatever we want to do, be it taste, be it uh, Madame Zangara, anything we want to do, we'll do it at Monte Cassino. That's the piazza at Monte Cassino. It's not just a Tuscan village. We have choreographers. You've now got a clock that you want people to listen to that chimes every 15 minutes. You've got a South Africa's largest TV, 54 square meters outside on the piazza, just to the right here. We're hosting everything from Bocktown to fan zones to the World Cup. The best seat to be if they ever playing is there at Monte Cassino, not necessarily at the stadium. We do it with all the pomp and ceremony, with celebrities and announcers and good music and fireworks at the end and everything else. We also have a stage where people are playing. And then we have a theater where 2,000 people are going to walk out of the theater. And we have a musical fountain. Now, we have to know with precision that if that show starts at 8 and finishes at 25 to 10, it's no good firing the fountain off at half past nine. You better fire that fountain off at 20 to 10 when the people are coming out. You've got to make sure the choreography of the chiming of the clock, the playing of the television, when the guy's going to play his guitar and when he hits the, the drums and how it happens, you've got to make it happen. It can't just be noise. So we have a vast team who are there making sure that we do it with consummate precision. you take something simple and because I'm pressed for time, take something as cinema. 
I don't know if you know this, but in Joburg North, there are more cinemas per people. It's the highest density of screens per population in the world. Okay, it's the vastness of the jungle and the trees in the, the northern suburbs, and then so many cinemas and complexes. We had to do something that was different. That's what I mean by decommoditize. So the reality is, when we went out there, we couldn't. It's a commodity. Coke, a popcorn, and a cinema, you can't change the ending to a Disney uh, movie. If there's a happy ending, you can't make it a sad one. The reality is, it is a commodity. So we had to decommoditize it. So what we did was we built the world's largest cinema screen. Because we wanted to be the best. Our vision at Monte Cassino is to be Gauteng's premier entertainment and hospitality destination. And by that, you have to be premier. So we built the Il Grande. The big screen at Il Grande is three stories high. It's 286 square meters. If you want to see a larger-than-life performance, that's where you want to see it. Surprise, surprise, we built specially a bar, a liquor license at a cinema. In there, it's a wonderful holding area. So if you're going to do a premiere or something at Monty, and every distributor now wants to use Monty as their uh, place to launch or release a premiere, well, you've got the most wonderful environment in which to hold guests and entertain guests, say speeches, drink a bottle of champagne, and then ultimately you go into the Il Grande, which is, as I say, the largest screen in the world. It's also business class. You can't kick the chair in front of you. You've got your own armrests, a big fat oaks like myself. The reality is you can stretch out, wallow, and suck on your whiskey. That's fine. Okay? Obviously, all the premiers, and there's hundreds of them, happen at Monte Cassino. It is now the best cinema house in South Africa, by far. By number, by advertiser, by premier, by desire, you name it. Another quick little example of what I mean by structuring your business correctly is you have to make sure that you live to your brand promise. When we put up there that Monte Cassino is going to be Gauteng's premier destination, premier means first, it doesn't mean second. So we had to go into a business which we knew nothing about and still know nothing about, but we opened up this thing called Scoobs, which is books spelt backwards. Because the books industry wasn't evolving in this country. And despite me telling Fred Withers at uh, Exclusive Books that he's redundant, irrelevant, and he's old outtakes, and he's past it, and he's finished, and all I do is just sell a book, we couldn't afford at Monte Cassino under any conditions to have the 43rd best bookstore in the country. Because if you've got a mission to be the best, how can you have a 43rd best bookstore? So we kicked him out. And when we kicked them out, we said, okay, well, now we better put our money where our mouth is, and now we better do a proper bookstore, which our mission was to have it as the best bookstore in the country. So we did. It's a special bookstore. It's one that's very dear to us because it now lives our brand. And the truth is, this bookstore, outside of the glass lifts in the middle, it's got, as you can see over here, this uh, is a 500 kilogram book stand, it also houses a book tank, which, oh, by the way, has fish in it. But the reality is, it's also got separate parts to it with sport. Television is an integral part. It's got Zen gardens. It's got a champagne bar. It's got a grand piano, which I was told with every idiot who doesn't understand experiential marketing, oh, you've got to worry about the trading density per square meter. Well, that does nothing for an experience to bring customers back. So every night you can go there and suck on a champagne, have a whiskey, and listen to the, the sounds of a beautiful, well-played grand piano in a champagne bar. More importantly, it's, as I said, got, it's got an outside area, the gardening area. It's transformed, and it is by far the best bookstore in South Africa today. And by the way, the numbers also went up 430% on what was originally there. Now, the truth is, if you have a look at that book tank, for example, it's those little subtleties. So, yeah, you can see copies of epoxy books, which are 20,000 leagues under the sea, etc., just for effect. 
But it's not a fish tank with books, it's a book tank with fish. It's those little things that make a difference. Now, I've run my time here, so what I'm going to leave you with, because there's hundreds of little examples where I could have taken you on a journey of just Monte Cassino, but I did pose you with the question of, imagine a world where magic lives. And it's about structuring a commoditized, boring, same old, same old business and understanding what you're trying to achieve, going out there, making it happen, and then ultimately trying to deliver it. And it's with that in mind that I will leave you and hopefully with the thoughts and belief that you can structure your business differently. You can embrace the senses. You can embrace little levers and differentiators like the content business because I believe at Monte Cassino we have more content under that roof, one roof, than any other place in the world because there isn't one bit of content in the world that we don't have free access to and can exploit as we do through our national television and our internal bedrooms through the 14 odd thousand bedrooms that we've got and through the jackpot entertainment which we use to sell more tickets and bring people back to keep relevant and make sure that Monte Cassino stays up there. Thank you. Those were all scenes from Monte Cassino, including the rugby at Bogtown. <laughs>